Our God calls us to worship, to enter an infinite embrace of unconditional love and holy mystery. We return again today to the source of all connection and creation. Our loving parent, the one who meets us in the secret places of our hearts and the public places of our world. Jesus calls us to awareness to begin to align our desires with God's greatest desires. Where God's justice and compassion reign, where forgiveness and reconciliation are possible, and where our needs and the needs of the world are met in full. The Holy Spirit calls us to transformation, to open our inner lives to the one who can enliven us again. For our souls yearn for the goodness, mercy, and joy of this life of faith, this life full of God. From our own private spaces, let us join in one great public act of worship. We will pray, sing, and offer our lives to God, trusting with each step we take, God is with us. season of Lent, we return to God in prayer, not only offering the words we speak, but offering our listening and contemplative presence, turning over our whole selves, our thoughts, feelings, and experiences to the unconditional love of Christ. In this time of silence, breathe deeply. Sigh with groans only the spirit can understand and trust that God accepts you fully just as you are.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Love in Christ. We have countless hopes for how our world may be changed for the better. Yet you desire change to first occur in our animals be. Help us renew the practices of prayer, fasting, and generosity in our lives, that they may bear fruit in us for the sake of the world. Guide our footsteps and the road we make by walking, as we love, live, and give like Jesus. Amen. Christ, you lead and we shall follow, stumbling though our steps may be. One with you in joy and sorrow, we the river, you the sea. We the river, you the sea. Living water of salvation, be the fountain of each soul. Spring Today's reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 1 through 18. May we be equipped by these words to walk in love for God, ourselves, our neighbors, all people, and all God's creation. Jesus continued to teach his disciples. Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them, for then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be, they may be praised by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. When you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think, that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then in this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so as to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, 
they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ. This is week 52 for anybody that's been counting. Exactly one year ago tomorrow, March 8th, will have been the last time we were together in person for worship as a congregation. Some of you may have lost count. Some of you may have been counting week by week. Trust me, I actually hadn't been counting that, but I knew we were getting close on the calendar, so I went back and took a look. As we enter into this sermon today, let's just stop and let's think about the different emotions and feelings that may come over you as you think about one year that we have made this change to not be together in person. What have you been carrying with you in your being? What are you feeling as we hit this mark of the one year anniversary of how this pandemic has drastically changed our congregation? Take just a moment and think about those feelings that you have within you. For some, those emotions and feelings you have may be quite negative. This may have felt like a painstaking year, agonizing to not be together as a community or to be in the space where you find rest and peace and solace in the presence of God. For others, there may be mixed emotions and even possibly positive emotions of recognizing the things that you have been able to enjoy and connect with this year, of the ways that your life has changed for the better of the new ways that we've been able to worship and connect with one another that weren't possible a year ago. And it's likely as we look at one another on the screen that we recognize that each person has some mixture of those feelings and emotions that come with this one year mark. But I ask you to think about not just how you are feeling, but tangibly how have you been changed over this last year? What has this last year done to change your life or to change your family's life or to change the life of people you know in your community? Because as we enter into this reflection on this middle part of the Sermon on the Mount, it's all about change and transformation. Now for this last year, for many of us, the change that we've been going through has been a reactive change or a passive change. If you were on during the children's time, we got to see Walter's rock collection. You all see those rocks, some of those that may have been found in a riverbank somewhere. Rocks oftentimes change, but not of their own accord. The rock itself does not make a decision to change, but the rock has forces that are forced upon it that cause it to change to have it be weathered down, to have it be made smooth. When that rock is in a river and the waters and the rapids are coming over those rocks, it's doing change to the rock. Over this last year, much of our change, most of the things that have been happening have been happening to us. The emergence of a new virus, the changes in how we live our lives to keep one another safe and healthy, the economic changes within our families due to those changes in our culture and society, and all of the other changes systemically throughout our culture that have happened, those have been changes that have happened to us. Now, don't hear me wrong. We've certainly adapted and changed ourselves when we've needed to, but we have been under great force. There have been things that have been forcing change upon us, much like those rocks in a river. 
But the change that Jesus invites his disciples into in the Sermon on the Mount is not a passive change. It's not a change that happens to us or happens to Jesus' disciples. It's a change that you actually have to initiate. It's a change that comes through beginning new habits or new behaviors or new disciplines that cause change within us. We as human beings are unique in this way, is that we actually can go beyond just being an inanimate object or being an animal that just responds to its own intrinsic responses, but we as human beings can self-reflect. We can make a decision to then adopt a new way of doing something consciously. That is what Jesus is speaking about in this section of the Sermon on the Mount, is change through the behaviors and habits and disciplines that can change our lives from the inside out. Not changes that make us perceive to be different on the outside, but habits and disciplines that actually do change our attitudes, our mindsets, our hearts and souls. And so let's look at those three disciplines that Jesus lifts up today as he invites the disciples into this life of transformation and change. The first is generosity, or as it said in the scriptures, is almsgiving, the act of giving something away to God through giving something away to others. That's a practice that we have seen robustly over this last year from people who have cared for neighbors and friends and for the community by giving away finances, by giving away time, by giving away food and possessions. But Jesus says, when we give to do those things in private, to not give in a way that shows off what you are giving, but in fact, do it in a way that changes your own inner being. So what is Jesus talking about there? Because it's awfully hard to actually give privately. Short of you being on your computer and making an anonymous donation to someone, it's really hard to give somebody money or resources privately. That's generally a public act. What Jesus is talking about here is that as you give and as you think about giving, what is the reason or the mindset behind why you give? Do you give out of a sense of guilt, out of feeling like it's something that you have to do or we're supposed to do? Do you give out of a sense of trying to impress someone or to change someone else's life? Perhaps. But what Jesus invites us into as we think about giving privately is to be able to change who we think about first. And rather than thinking about our own needs or our own wants or our own desires, to think first about what we can give out of what God has blessed us with. And the more we practice that type of private giving, a giving that truly comes from the heart for wanting to care and provide for others, we begin to see a shift in our being of how we relate to the world around us and to other people. We begin to notice the needs of others before thinking about what we want for ourselves. And that happens from the private act of thinking about how we give or why we give. But it's the act of actually giving that then changes us. Jesus will go on to say, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Notice that it's not the other way around. We oftentimes think about it reversed, that where our heart is, what we care about, then our money will follow. Jesus actually says, where you put your money, there your heart will be also. That act of giving changes the things that we think about and those things that we care about. Jesus then goes on to a second discipline in this section and talks about fasting or this discipline of intentionally giving something up, not to give away, but to refrain from indulging in something in our lives. And to do that also privately, to not show how good of a person you are by being able to withstand from things that you may love, 
But instead, in a private moment, for instance, if you were to give up food and you begin to feel those hunger pangs within you, your stomach begins to gurgle and you're like, I could just go to the refrigerator for what I need. Instead, in those moments where you begin to think about what you've given up, set, begin to recognize what your desire is. Is your desire simply for that thing that will satisfy your hunger? Is your desire simply for that thing that will take away the pain? Is your desire simply for that thing that may distract you from the other realities in your lives? Or is your desire for God and a yearning for God's presence in your life and in our world by withholding something from us, whether that's food or something else, by fasting, it gives us a physical bodily experience of knowing that we want something and for us to make a conscious change to determine what is it that we want. And it's God's heart and God's desire that the thing that we want more than anything else is God and God's love and God's presence and God's compassion and grace and joy to fill up our lives first and foremost before food, before pleasure, before security. And that we can receive life in God. So that's two disciplines that Jesus talks about that can change us from the inside out. But the third then is prayer. The act of coming to God in prayer. And it's here that Jesus teaches his disciples a prayer that we have made an ostensibly public prayer. For many of us, we pray the Lord's Prayer when we are together in a public space, in worship, when we're getting ready to celebrate communion. That is the space where we play that prayer. Now, for others, that prayer may be a prayer that you speak privately in your own devotional life at home. But this prayer, even though its language has changed and shifted through the centuries, in whatever translation you may find it in, it essentially has four different movements. Is that this prayer first directs us to orient everything in our being to God, to say that my intent and desire is to bring my life, my heart, soul, and mind before God, who is the loving source of all things that we receive. Our Father who art in heaven, our loving parent, who is ever present, that source of love that we can come to at any point in our day. Let us orient ourselves to God. The second movement in that prayer then is to orient our greatest desires and hopes, not for our own, but again, towards those great hopes and desires of God that I think can be summed up in the desires and hopes we see in Jesus the desires for God's love to be known by all people, the desires for all people, regardless of income, regardless of physical condition, regardless of identity, to be able to be included in this world, to experience God's compassionate embrace, and for God's justice to then be known throughout the world, that that embrace and compassion can be lived out in the systems and structures of power that we see all around us. When we pray, thy will be done on earth as in heaven, it's not about praying to God for something that will come. It's about making God's vision and dream real here and now, and our invitation and hopes to be able to participate within it. And then that third move from aligning our hopes and desires with God is to bring our great needs before God both our physical needs and emotional needs, the things that we need, like our food each day and the shelter that we live within, but also our great spiritual needs, those things like forgiveness and reconciliation. And that we recognize when we bring our needs before God, that we're also called to then participate with God in helping to provide for the needs of others that we are God's response when our neighbor is praying for what they need. We are the ears of God listening for how we can respond. And this prayer brings us into that great communal need of ourselves 
and our world. But then from those needs, we focus back outward to the world, praying to God to lead us not into temptation, to not lead us to places where we will give away God's dreams instead for worldly desires, but instead that God may lead us towards life, that God may be with us and liberate us from evil and systems of evil in our world, and that we may participate with God in leading our world away from those evils as well. Four motions that Jesus invites his disciples into to have their lives changed in this life of prayer. That if they can come to God in those four motions on a regular basis, that they will begin to see change for themselves. So why does Jesus invite his disciples into these three disciplines of generosity and fasting and prayer? It's because we are the ones that have to be changed first before we can truly see change in our world. We have to be hardened and fat and, and formed to be able to prepare to go out and to serve, not out of our own ambitions, but out of discerning how God is leading us forward. We have to have our hearts and souls and minds changed first. And Jesus models this not just on the mountain, but Jesus models it as he prepares to go to Jerusalem on this journey towards Good Friday. Perhaps the most poignant scene we have in all of the scriptures of both this private moment of prayer, but yet public witnesses in the Garden of Gethsemane. As Jesus is getting ready to lose his life, he takes his disciples to the garden and he goes off on his own to pray, but calls on them to be close by and to stay awake. And it's there that Jesus, out of an entire lifetime of being formed through his own prayer life, he prays the words, Father, if this cup could be taken from me, but yet not my will, but your will be done. Jesus hands his life over to God in prayer, knowing what is to come, knowing the difficulties of living out God's love in the world, but yet trusting that God was with him and that God would be with him even beyond death in the resurrection. And that is where we place our trust as well that when we give our lives over to these disciplines, when we allow our lives and hearts and souls to be changed, that God will be with us, that God will give us the courage to go out and to know what is ours to do and what is ours to change and what is ours to let go of and to let go in peace. This is the work of proactive change in our lives. And so where we find ourselves today as a congregation, as people of faith, as Christ the King here in Southwest Denver, is a point where we do know that the pandemic will be coming to a close. It will end. We have hope and light that this is going to be ending at some point in our future. And we will get to celebrate as we get to gather again as the church. But what Jesus invites us to in this moment, and what I invite all of us into as a community of faith today, is to not allow this last year and still the weeks in front of us to go by as wasted moments. To just simply say, well, we adjusted and adapted and changed because we had to, but instead to take up the invitation from Jesus today and ask, how can we proactively come back to God in prayer as we discern what our next steps are forward. Because we could be reactive in these next steps. We could just be looking at the public health measures as when it is the right time to open our doors. And we could just show up in church and keep on doing what we were doing a year ago. Or in these next weeks to come, we can come back to God in prayer. We can come back and say, God, who are you creating us to be anew again today? 
How do you need us to change and to form our worship life, not from the past, but for the future ahead? How are you calling on us to give up certain things in order to be able to know your presence and to yearn for your spirit? And how are you calling on us to even be more generous, not for our own sake, not just for our church, but for our community and neighbors and world around us? How do you need us, God, to continue to change, not just to be reformed? Sisters and brothers, this is an active journey. It is a choice we get to make for these next steps ahead. Let us, in the spirit of the Sermon on the Mount, return to God in prayer, still not exactly sure what the road ahead may be, but trusting that God is with us, and that the Holy Spirit will continue to lead us as long as we keep our hearts open to God's leading. May God's peace be with you. Amen. together in confessing the communal faith of the church in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the, the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe, I believe in, in the Holy Spirit, Spirit the, the Holy Catholic, Catholic Church, the, the communion, communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. 
Throughout this season of Lent, we have been inviting the congregation to offer your own prayers through your own spoken words as part of the prayers of the church. During this third Sunday in Lent, we pray for the leaders of our world, in our country, and in our local communities. An opportunity for pray to those who we give authority to, to be our voices and to enact policies on our behalf. To those throughout our world who we pray can live into God's great dreams of compassion and justice being lived out for all people. And so today I invite you, if you have your prayer cards with you, to get those out and to put down some words or some petitions for how it is that we pray for the leaders of our world today. And in a moment, after we listen to some special music, we'll have a chance to offer these prayers aloud or in the chat box again. So let us write our prayers to God as we listen to the music today. Thank you. 
Our God walks with us through the wilderness and hears our prayers. As citizens of our world, we appoint leaders to faithfully guide the well-being of the common good. We pray for all those in whom we place our trust, that they may govern with love, justice, and mercy. Please unmute and offer your spoken prayers one at a time. You can also offer your prayers in the chat box. I pray that our leaders will work for all the people, for their safety, their health, for their equality. I pray that we stand by our leaders to support and help them. I pray for President Biden, Vice President Kamala Harris, our legislatures and all our leaders and their assistants. And I pray for those most vulnerable and who may be affected most negatively by legislative decisions. I also pray for all the assistants who work um, in our in our legislative branches. We hear a prayer from the chat box. Please guide our leaders to make difficult decisions that affect our city, state, nation, and world. Thank you, God. We pray that you give our national and local leaders the wisdom and common sense to guide this country through our continuing struggle with COVID-19. Amen. We lift up our prayers that leaders of all people may commit to leading with integrity and authenticity rejecting duplicity and divisiveness, and embracing a genuine concern for the inclusion and care for each person and community of our world. Allow love to be their guide and your vision of justice their aim and goal. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. We pray for our sisters and brothers in Christ and our neighbors, family, and friends who are suffering this day. We pray especially for Al Schlager, Harold Walker, Gail Larson, Dorothy Riglin, Pat Sandstead, Bill Markheim, Paul Parsons, Dorothy Van Dusen, Jean Rhine, Jim Moss, Eric Larson, Justine Ager, Lisa Sant'Angelo, Brian Braun, Bob Scrivano, Elena Martinez, Heidi Simon, Diana Hilt, Renee Schroeder, Danielle Zambrano, Ethel Dixon, Sean Sugden, Lisa Hickman, Erin LaBelle, and Maggie Martinez. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Dwelling in your goodness, we trust that you hear and feel all of our prayers, those on our lips and those held deep within our being. With confidence in your mercy and compassion, we pray together. 
loving, loving Christ, Christ who guides, who guides our, our way. way. Receive, Receive now our prayers and our offerings. This Lent, we offer you our whole lives, given up for service and love of others. Transform us into humble vessels of your grace, poured out for the world. Nurture our journey as disciples, that we may become hope for all who we meet. On this road we walk. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And, and also, also with, with you. you. Please take a moment and share a sign of peace with others on your screen today. Got a digital peace sign creation from Fred Tafoya there today. I had seen some watercolor art at a point earlier in our service. Thank you all for the ways that you're sharing the peace with one another. And thank you all for your continued generosity for the sake of our mission as a congregation. You can continue to drop off your offerings here at the CTK office or by mailing them in here to the office, or you can donate online at ctkdenver.org or through your own banking institutions. If you have any questions, please reach out to us here at the church office and we'll be happy to assist you. At this time, let us prepare to celebrate communion. If you have a form of bread and a form of drink, please get those close by to your computer and we'll bless all of our elements as part of the communion liturgy today. The Lord be with you. And, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We, we lift them to, to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It, it is, is right to, to give God thanks and praise. praise. We praise you and we bless you, holy and gracious creator, source of life. Your spirit has always been with creation, guiding its development, calling forth life, infusing beauty, inspiring joy and love. In your infinite love, you created us in your image and allowed us to share in the precious gift of life. You gave us a home in this beautiful world to live in harmony with you, with one another, and with all of your creatures. But we have so often turned from your wisdom. We have chosen our own way and broken faith with you, our neighbors, and our fellow creatures. Now all around us, we see the tragic harvest of the bitter seed we have sown. Yet through it all, you have remained faithful to us. You graciously called us to turn from our destructive ways and return to you. You sent us prophets, priests, sages, storytellers, and poets to lead us to repentance and wisdom. In the fullness of time, through Mary, a humble woman full of faith, you sent Jesus into the world. Living among us, Jesus loved us. In word and deed, he proclaimed the good news of your reign. He broke bread with outcasts and sinners. In an imitation of your perfect love, he taught us to love neighbor, stranger, outsider, and enemy. He redirected us from violence to peace, from fear to faith, from rivalry to mutual service, and from worry and greed to generosity and joy. We remember that in the night before he showed us the full extent of his love, Jesus took bread gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to the disciples to eat, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this for remembrance of me. And again after supper, he took the cup, blessed it, and gave it to the disciples, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this. For remembrance of me. Gathered as one family around our own tables, from our own places of joyful reconciliation and fellowship, united in your spirit, we receive these gifts and gratefully offer you our lives. As Christ stretched out his arms upon the cross to welcome the whole world into your gracious embrace, we rejoice to enter that embrace and with you to extend it to all. 
through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to the living God be honor, glory, and praise forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. From wherever you are and with whatever elements are before you, because God loves you just as you are, with whatever you've done or left undone and in spite of anything that the world says about you, we proclaim together that all are welcome to receive these gifts from God's table today. For in Christ, all means all. And the gifts of God are free. You are welcome to celebrate communion by simply eating of the form of bread and the form of drink you have with you or by dipping the bread into your drink. We'll first commune those of you who are alone today, and then you may use the words on your screen to offer communion to those who you are with at home. Let us celebrate this meal. This is the body of Christ given for you. And this is the blood of Christ shed for you. Please now share this meal with one another. And now I invite you to hear a blessing. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. Reminded of who we are, fed with the word, nourished with a meal. We are now sent into the world to love, live, and give like Jesus. The Lenten journey calls us to new paths, new ways of living and serving in the world. Not Not only that that we may change the lives of those those we serve, but but that that God God may change change our lives, our our hearts, hearts, and minds 
in, in each encounter. Let us again pick up our crosses and follow Jesus. Trusting that on the other side of darkness, division, despair, and death, new life and resurrection await. May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May God look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us go forth in joy and peace to love and serve God and our neighbors. Thanks be to God.